Good morning, Dubai. I can think of no better place to talk about our ideas for cities in the future than in Dubai, one of the great new cities of the world. Uh, we live in a, a very interesting time. We're, we live in a period of extreme urbanization. About half the people in the world now live in cities. 90% of the population growth from here on out will take place in, in cities. I give a lot of these talks at conferences about cities, and they tend to have names like this, like smart city, green city, sustainable city, intelligent city, low carbon, eco, resilient city, et cetera. I think, I think in most cases, there's some good ideas here, but they're framed far too narrowly. The question that we like to ask is this one, what enables a high performance, livable, entrepreneurial city? High performance is about minimizing the resource, resources that individuals use, livable, of course, quality of life. Entrepreneurial is, a, is about supporting innovation, jobs, increasing GDP, uh, et, et cetera. Uh, and we're, we're looking at what enables innovation in particular. Uh, innovation districts are now a hot topic. Many cities all over the world are looking towards developing innovation districts. As Brookings Institution uh, article recently, the rise of innovation districts. Uh, we've had many cities come to us asking, how do you enable innovation? And in fact, the definition of innovation is hard, hard to come by, let alone what enables innovation in a city. Uh, we look at where innovation is actually taking place uh, because almost all of the innovation takes place in cities. In fact, 93% of patented inventions in cities. But the world is not flat in this regard. Innovation tends to take place in Japan, Korea, Northern Europe, the coasts of the US, a few bubbles here and there. They have the special combination of policy and design and culture and technology and business climates to support innovation. What we're finding, though, in terms of what cities can control that social ties are, are key. This is a study uh, in a workplace where uh, people were instrumented, you, you um, were able to determine the degree of interaction between people, how broad their social networks were, how deep they were, how many people they communicated with, the breadth of that communication. And in this diagram, you will see dots in isolation. These are people who don't communicate well with others. And you'll see a web of people in yellow. These are super networkers, and they tend to be the most innovative, the most connected, the most productive. The same applies to a city. And what we're finding is if you want to support the development of deep and broad social ties, you need to bring together these three attributes, density, proximity, diversity. Density, we think of broadly as residential density, employment density, cafe shops, cultural venues. You can do density poorly, you can do it well. We'll talk about that a little bit. Proximity is about getting things in the right place, and we're, we think of it in a home-centric way. What is the distance between your home and the amenities that you need in daily life? How close are you to recreation, jobs, shopping, uh, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Diversity, we also think very broadly. This is not just demographic diversity, but the diversity of enterprises, big companies, little companies, um, research centers, et cetera. Housing diversity, which is essentially the same as demographic diversity. If you don't provide housing for people that are not well served by the marketplace, then you will not have a diverse community. And activity diversity. You bring this all together through creative applications of new urban systems and you can have the good without the bad. That is our theory. Density done poorly leads to traffic congestion, pollution, loss of contact with nature, crime, disease. Done, done well, it leads to increase in GDP, better jobs, better restaurants, better security, more eyes on the street. So it's neither good or bad. It depends on how you, how you develop it. The new systems we're looking at are related to mobility, related to food, related to live-work environments. And if you do that,
properly, we think quality of life will go up, the number of jobs will go up, innovation will increase, and you will dramatically reduce the resource consumption per person. This is essentially our research agenda uh, at my group at MIT. Let me start with a brief history of cities because we like to, to look to the past. Much of what we do is informed by the best ideas of the past. And settlements typically began with people gathered around a scarce resource like a, like a well. And the distance of that settlement was typically the distance that a person could walk, for example, with a pot of water on their head like that woman there tended to be about a, a kilometer or so. This is a uh, beautiful diagram of a city from 3,500 years ago, the city of Mari in the Euphrates. Uh, and if you look carefully, you will see a highly dense core, uh, a second ring inside the outer wall where you had the high value food production like orchards, and then you saw the, the lower value fields that fed that city. And these, these cities tended to be about, as I said, about a kilometer in diameter. This is uh, Levon from the Middle Ages. Something like 4,000 years later, the same exact diagram. High density core, high value food production, uh, lower value food production that fed the city. And you literally find hundreds of these diagrams all over the world, in Europe, in Asia, in Latin America. Paris is a particularly good example. It started out as this compact cell, sort of the ultimate compact, walkable community in many ways. And as it, as it grew, it networked into uh, a, an aggregation of multiple districts. You can see the point where the city started to grow was the introduction of the Industrial Revolution. We had fairly stable uh, population until, we, until the Industrial Re Revolution. Railroads, cars, green revolution, internet, all essentially happened instantly given the time scale of human activity. With industrialization, things began to change. Factories were dirty, they were moved to the outskirts of the city. We had networks that connected uh, people. They could live remote from the core. Production was centralized in factories. Energy production centralized in, in power plants, healthcare in hospitals, learning in schools. And uh, we had uh, all kinds of new food production technology developing in the early 20th century. Uh, you could move food produced di uh, quite a distance away from the city, efficiently into the city through rail cars and other means. Street cars allowed functions to be more separated. And then we had the car. And the car changed everything. Uh, and we, developed, we started to develop a new model, I would argue a more dysfunctional model for cities. Low density, sprawl, connected by cars, separated functions. The idea is that you spread out the functions, you connect everything by a highway, you let everyone who can afford it buy a car, you make sure there's a parking place when they get there, and that is uh, the same model that is being followed in China, slightly higher density tower sprawl, and we end up with conditions like this. I shot this video out of the window of my taxi cab while I was in Beijing on a very good day. If you look at the sign up there, it's all green and yellow, there's no red. So this is a good traffic day in Beijing, and it can take hours to get from one point of the city to the other. I had a similar experience in Riyadh not long ago. The same is true in Sao Paulo, many cities all over the world. Let me talk a little bit about uh, urban innovation and our notion for where we would like to see city go, cities go in the future. So the first intervention is an, returning to an old idea. There's nothing new here, it's just not how we're building cities today. Create communities that are compact, dense, diverse, and walkable to promote these creative exchanges, uh, exchanges of ideas that will promote innovation. So Paris, I mentioned that small little core. As Paris grew, it developed into a network of neighborhoods, each with their own identity, each connected by mass transit. Uh, and Paris, of course, is one of the most walkable cities in the world. Every dot there is a cafe. 
There's no cafe district. The same is true with shops and physicians. Physicians are evenly distributed all over the city. Pharmacies, there, there is essentially no place in Paris where a pharmacy is more than a two or three minute walk from your home. Highly walkable community with a very even distribution of infrastructure. And in China, they would put the hospital district in the, down in the corner, and that's where all the pharmacies would be at least the old model. So we have a simple idea. You create a network of these higher density compact urban cells, maybe a kilometer in diameter. Uh, you find the optimal density, which I think in many cases is 25 to 30,000 people per square kilometer. And the process of making a city is networking these communities together, connecting by mass transit, and providing good alternatives to private automobiles within each of these compact urban cells. Very simple idea, one that we haven't seen followed very often. Now, how are we modeling this? We're using Lego bricks. We love Lego bricks. It's actually an incredibly powerful tool. We, we design with a Lego unit, this tiny little, how many of you have used Lego bricks? Okay, good. Everyone here. They're, <laughs> they're very non-threatening. Everybody knows they can play with Lego bricks. This is a data unit. Uh, we can assign different types of data to it. This can be yellow assigned to retail. That little small Lego unit can accommodate, for example, two workers if it's a restaurant or 300 customers per day. If it's Starbucks, you can map revenue and construction costs, whatever you want to it. And we can rapidly put together this city. In this case, black is, is, is housing, white is office, yellow is retail. This is a model of Kendall Square. We can iterate very quickly. We realized that was not enough. That was, that was a good schematic design tool, but we needed more powerful tools to visualize what was really happening. This is from the movie Avatar. I like this a lot because it shows people standing around a table discussing uh, how to, in this case, fight wars better. But they're, they're, they're doing that by, by visualizing in a very compelling way, complex three-dimensional data sets. We thought we could do much the same for urban planning. This is Kendall Square where I work. It's the same pattern you find in, in Paris. You go from Kendall Square to Central Square, Harvard Square, Porter Square. They're all about a kilometer to a mile apart. They each have a center and their own identity. So we modeled Kendall Square where MIT is. Uh, in this case, we're using an augmented reality strategy of having multiple projectors project information onto this three-dimensional model. And the green, in this case, are all the interventions that we're looking at for housing. Kendall Square, by the way, has 40,000 people working there per day, only 3,000 people living. It's quite um, dysfunctional in that there are great flows of people in and out like you find in many cities. Uh, so we can, we can collect all kinds of data to visualize what's happening. This is some of the easier things to visualize, uh, the satellite view. We can, we can run uh, simulations of solar radiation on the city, wind flows. Uh, we can look at uh, where the money is. This gets a little more interesting when you use unusual data sets. That bright yellow spot in the center is the Cambridge Innovation Center with 350 startups. You can see how intense that is in terms of flow of venture money. We, we look at mobility modes. This is subway, shared bikes, shuttles, etc. all the different modes. Uh, this I find very interesting. This is a real-time geolocated Twitter feed. So the student sends a tweet, hashtag CityScope. The media lab lights up. That's where he was. His tweet is shown on the board. We can collect all of uh, the tweets that are happening that, that, uh, that have location turned on in the area. And we find this is a, a very good proxy for where the activity of young people uh, is. Up, up on the upper corner, you see the media lab where I work, the artificial intelligence lab. They are very bright because there's a lots of activity by young people. The Sloan School, the business school, is not so bright. I'm not sure why. <laughs> The, uh, in the center is a totally dark building. That's a government building, a center for transportation. Not a single tweet coming from that building. 
This hot spot in the center is Third Street where all the new restaurants are that are affordable for young people, so that's where they're hanging out in lunch. And so you can, you can see the blue dots accumulate as uh, young people are more and more active sending tweets. We can look at land use. Uh, this is now a portable version of what we call the city scope that we took to Australia where a new city was being designed. They said, we, we've designed a very walkable community. We have a central business district, housing around. Uh, we instinctively did not think it was actually very walkable, so we modeled this in Lego bricks. So red bricks are the central business district, blue the housing. We can control the parameters that I talked about at the beginning, density, uh, proximity by manipulating how far someone will walk, a cultural variable. And here as they're moving jobs closer to housing, you see that number change. Uh, it's a real-time walk score that's calculating the likelihood that someone will actually walk from where they live to where they work. We used this in a public hearing, presenting this tool to the city planning officers who then could play with it, literally play with it themselves, and, and came to the conclusion that the stated objectives of their zoning ordinances were not actually uh, met through the actual ordinance. Uh, we're, we're, uh, we have a project to work on a new district in Riyadh. We tried this in a very different cultural context, also found it very powerful. It's not only a two-dimensional tool, but we can use a, uh, a three-dimensional version of this. In this case, the student puts a tower down. We may map data to that, the occupancy of that building, offices, residential, the types of units. And then when we place these Lego bricks, we're building a data set uh, that can be analyzed computationally, and we're developing a whole suite of these simulation tools. So here he's building a city on the fly. The geometry of each of those bricks uh, can be mapped to any kind of, uh, any kind of geometry. These can be Frank Gehry buildings or, or whatever. We can project on the facade. We can, we can, use, uh, we can project data visualizations. We're, we're finding that there really is no end to what we can do with this. We took this to Las Vegas, uh, this is the platform. It's a clear table. Uh, we, we built uh, a new model of, of uh, Kendall Square. We like to use young people. By the way, we discovered young people like to play with Legos as much as graduate students. That was a, that was a revelation. And here you can see the young people building the city. Uh, but in this case, we built, we built it with these movable bricks so we could study different, uh, different interventions, different housing office building, mobility interventions, uh, et cetera. And, and as you do that, you get feedback on, on the screen. Eventually, we'll build a tool that, that is a, a more immersive experience. This is now where we're most excited about is modeling human interactions. In this case, you have two office buildings. You can see very little interaction. You bring in housing, very little interaction until you increase the density, add cafes and shops. And we can predict, if we know the profile of the people in these buildings, we can predict when there may be a creative interaction that could lead to a new idea, that could lead to a new company, that could lead to, that could lead to the, next, the next Google. No guarantee, but we're increasing the probability by getting the right combination of density, proximity, and diversity in that compact district. In this case now, we're doing something um, equally complicated but uh, interesting to me. We're, we're looking at what happens if you get rid of private automobiles and you introduce shared use autonomous vehicles such that everyone has the opportunity for a vehicle to pick them up at their doorstep. They can get out wherever they wish and go on their way. And what kind of infrastructure can you put into the city? So let's talk about our second intervention, mobility on demand. This is creating alternatives to the private automobile in compact districts. If you increase the density, if you're relying on private cars, you quickly hit a wall with density where going beyond that increases traffic and parking problems. Uh, we think we can, we can address that by acknowledging this trend, which is really powerful, the sharing economy. This was the cover of The Economist magazine from last year. And this is a trend I believe in. I see it with all our students. I see it with, with young people. Baby boomers like me are skeptical in many cases, but young people get it. This is, this is really happening. 
This is our model for mobility on demand. These are all the modes that we think are important to have. They're all shared modes. Okay, moving away from ownership society to sharing. The most important is up on the upper left, that's walking. You want to design for walking. Second most important are, are bicycles. Uh, you want to connect these uh, compact districts with, with mass transit. I think in the future we'll be moving away from fixed rail. It will be dynamically routed shuttle on demand that can go door to door using very powerful rout routing algorithms, very lightweight infrastructure that's agile and can change over time. The vehicles in red are the ones we designed in our group. So we have here the, um, the green wheel, which has a drive motor and battery in the wheel. You can retrofit a bicycle to be an electric bike, a little three-wheeler we're working on. The robo-scooter, which is an electric scooter that folds to occupy very little space in the city car. All of these modes are available to you, so you have the right mode at the right time for the right purpose. You can use multiple modes for a single trip. Let me talk uh, just briefly about uh, some of the things we've been working on. This, this is the city car project that we did a couple of years ago. We decided that we needed to have a vehicle that, uh, that took up very, very little land when parked in high value cities. In this case, we have four innovations. The wheels are actually robo wheels, uh, drive motor, steering, braking, suspension, all in each wheel. Get rid of the engine, transmission, you don't need those things in that case. You can fold it up so it occupies very little space. The length is the width of a conventional car. It's all drive by wire, so the steering wheel can pivot up, the front door opens, you step directly out, and we can get at least three of these vehicles in the space of one conventional vehicle in the context of parallel parking in the city. People thought this was a crazy media lab idea, but we work with industrial sponsors. We were able to build a full-scale prototype of this. Here you see the yoke that can pivot. You can drive it in Hong Kong and mainland China the same day. Uh, it folds. We've, we've had uh, three Chinese companies come to us who want to license this and build it. We launched this at uh, the EU headquarters in Brussels. That's the president of the EU, Barossa, citing this as one of the great European Union, US social innovations. Uh, that's our sponsor who was happy that day. Uh, but that's an old project. I'm, I'm actually not that excited about this project anymore because things, new things are happening. This is, I think, the future, where you combine autonomy, vehicle sharing, electrification. If you have autonomous vehicles, you don't park them in high value areas. They park themselves on the outskirts of the city or under a bridge or in a basement. You don't have to have access to them uh, <clears throat> directly in the city. If we have these uh, driverless cars, and you'll see some vi visioning of that in the exhibit here. If you have driverless cars moving through the city, we realize if a human walks in front of the car, there's no human to make eye contact in the car. Therefore, the vehicle needs to make eye contact with you and signal its intention. You don't want to walk in front of a driverless car if you don't know whether it's going to move ahead and potentially run you over. So in this case, the student prototyped a vehicle which actually has been adopted by a car company in their autonomous vehicle prototype that... Uh, actually signals its intention to you the way a human does. We like that because it's solving a problem that doesn't really exist yet, but will. Those are the best kinds of problems for us. This is a little three-wheel vehicle that, uh, that I think could change the city. We're looking at different versions of this. This is a bicycle inter uh, implementation. It could be enclosed and air-conditioned for use in the Middle East. Uh, it... Uh, gets the equivalent of three or 400 miles to the gallon. The idea is that, that it would be all shared use. Uh, that was the first prototype. This is the second one that we're now building. It meets the European Union regulations for a bike lane vehicle. The pedaling is required to be on a bike lane, but it can, it can be, a, uh, the power input can vary according to your physiology. So if you're a little old lady, it's just a switch and you drive it in, in electric mode. If you're an athlete, you have to pedal harder, use more energy to, uh, to go faster. The transformation in this case, though, is converting to a goods mover. If you design this shared use system so you satisfy the mobility needs of all the humans at rush hour at peak load, 
you have to introduce quite a few vehicles, which mean there are many that are not used in off-peak hours. So in this concept, the off-peak vehicles are now used to deliver goods with a new kind of container. It can dock with a building and offload it. Again, this seems like a little bit of a crazy idea, but we're finding that many of the companies dealing with the, the problems of moving goods in a high-density city like this idea, and we're looking at putting a consortium together to solve all of these problems. We're actually quite excited about this. Uh, autonomous pickup and drop-off can happen today. This is a prototype part of the MIT Singapore Alliance. In this case, a golf cart was retrofitted with autonomy technology, and it will pick people up wherever they are, take them to their destination, they get out of the vehicle, and they go on their way. This is a, just a, a, a video that students made just for fun, so you can see them engaged in all kinds of activities, putting on a tie, uh, shaving. You know, the point is, in this case, the vehicle has control. It's actually perhaps an order of magnitude less safe if the human is in control. So the problem is not technology, the problem is liability and public policy and other types of issues that you all here at this government system, uh, summit perhaps can identify. Uh, how we build the, the networks, uh, we use information like this. This was showing the movement of mobile phones within the city, uh, pick up and drop off points for taxis at night. Uh, you can, uh, if, if you have sufficient information, you can classify people according to their membership in a nightlife tribe. You know, you know, families going to family restaurants, young people going to bars and clubs, and then you can map that information back onto the city and find where people live and where people work and then design mobility systems to respond to that. What you tend to find, the people in the blue dots, that nightlife tribe tend to buy the same ties, they sign buy the same shoes, the same cell phones, they exhibit a lot of similar behaviors. This kind of information is very powerful when, when one is thinking about the design of a new city and particularly the mobility systems. This is now modeling what happens if we introduce um, shared use autonomous vehicles in the city. If you pay attention to the lower right hand corner, this is shared use started out private cars with shared use, you can, you can serve the city with about a third the number of vehicles, about half the parking, convenience, meaning the wait time, the time to get from your origin to your destination is less. The real power comes when you introduce shared use autonomous vehicles. You can serve the city with a third the vehicles, essentially get rid of all parking, and increase the convenience of people. Other things happen too, you get rid of traffic lights, you get rid of, of turn signals, of turn lanes, of parking lots, I mean, there's a profound change. And I would say anyone who is not thinking about these issues, but is, is involved in the process of designing a, a new city will regret it in 10 years because this is a change that will happen very quickly. We have a project with the city of Hamburg, the mayor of Hamburg has announced that the city will be car free by 2034. I think he means private car free. There will be cars, but alternatives to the private car. The third uh, urban innovation I'd like to talk about is food. Uh, we're developing what we call uh, open urban agriculture. This is addressing the needs of nutrition, water and energy scarcity, food security. This is our newest project, and we've come to realize that this is incredibly powerful. Again, cities need to be thinking about food. And, and why is that? Food insecurity, according to many, is the most dramatic problem facing mankind. Uh, these are the food secure companies. North America, Northern Europe, Australia, no worries. We're just fine. These are all the food insecure company, countries, where some of which are food colonies, where food is being produced to, to serve the US and Europe in particular. And uh, there's predictions of war and famine if these issues aren't, aren't dealt with. In China, I spent a lot of time in China over the last couple of years, 30% of the farmland, active farmland, 
is contaminated now with heavy metals. All of this food is entering the supply chain. People don't know whether you, what you're eating in a restaurant, buying in a market is healthy or not. Uh, I know people that are refusing to buy vegetables in the markets or eat in restaurants in China because they don't know whether it's contaminated. There literally is, literally is no way to know. Uh, water scarcity, some people say water scarcity, that's a problem particularly in this part of the world, is um, the greatest problem facing mankind. This is uh, industrial scale farming in an arid environment. The circles are from the radius of the irrigation system. This is not sustainable. It only works because of cheap water and cheap energy. This will change. This is, uh, excuse me, this is my urban garden. I'm an urban farmer. This is my produce from last summer. Those are my Brussels sprouts, but this is not sustainable. This is a hobby. This will not save the world. We're looking for, we're, we're looking for new approaches. So we built uh, City Farm. We realized there were, there were many great agricultural schools. Uh, many, many companies are doing uh, really interesting things with, uh, genetics, et cetera, but, but no one was focused primarily on the technology of growing foods in cities. We thought this would be a great project for MIT. This is our first city farm. Uh, it was a, in, a, in a small room. We were looking at hydroponics and aeroponics, the sensors that were necessary to observe and modify the, the, the environment of the plants. We were able to grow regularly enough food to feed the entire media lab. Uh, lots of fresh lettuce. Uh, we, uh, you can see here our uh, hydroponics, aeroponics. I'll talk about that in a minute. This is our latest city farm that we just finished last year. It's in the facade of the building. We're looking at capturing sunlight, augmenting that with artificial light, building a sensor network so we can grow a diversity of plants and control the microclimates uh, of, of each. Uh, so it, it, it's, re it's really a lab to experiment with different systems, run controlled experiments to see if it is feasible to ultimately skin buildings with high-tech food production uh, and, and produce this food in an affordable way, way so it can scale to the city. Those are the roots of the plants that are misted with aeroponics. It's just a manifold that, that produces... Uh, mist with, with, uh, with nutrients. These are our farmers, by the way, our undergraduate farmers. <laughs> They're collecting the data, uh, and we're, we're developing now an open network. We'd like to develop an open ag network where we have people all over the world. We'd like to have one here in Dubai developing, uh, testing this food production technology, sharing the data, sharing what works, what doesn't work, and build this community that can rapidly iterate the the ag industry tends to be very closed with IP lockdown. We want this to be just the opposite, totally open. No IP. Here's, uh, here's the, the, the uh, readout. You can get to this on the web if you go to MIT City Farm. You can see in real time all the data coming out of the City Farm. Let me show you the potential of this. If you grow broccoli in dirt, you can produce about three heads of broccoli per year. If you grow it with aeroponics, you have about five times the production in that same square footage. But in the kind of labs that we're developing, you tend to have three high in a one-story array. So that means 54 heads of lettuce per, uh, of broccoli per square foot. Now, if you were to take that two-meter layer double wall facade in effect like architects are thinking about and skin the tallest building in Boston, the Hancock building, you could uh, rather than three heads per square foot, you can have 3,240 per square foot, we think. Okay, imagine if many of the buildings in Dubai were skinned with this kind of food production technology, it could change could change the game. We think it will prove, and this is why we're building the lab to check these numbers, we can, we can grow high quality produce, three times the nutrient value with 90% less water, tastes better, pharmaceutical purity, no contamination, no pesticides, 60% less fertilizer, which in effect is, is energy in large part. 
This is what we'd like to see in the cities. And we believe that if we can produce food in a highly visible way, right where people live and work, uh, then we can reestablish the kind of relationship to food that people had back, uh, you know, up until 100 years ago. This is, our, this is our notion for an open ag project. We would like to, and I think Dubai will pop up here, we would like to have this network of innovators all over the world experimenting with this. We think we're, we're just getting started. We're, we're kind of in the mainframe stage of food technology right now. We're not in the PC era, certainly not in the mobile phone era. But if we get this community of innovators working together, we can uh, make big progress and maybe we can get back to the kind of relationship people had with their food in about 4,000 years ago. The last area I'd like to talk about is what we're doing with places of living and work. Uh, we're looking particularly at transformable homes, co-working. This is to increase the diversity and also the density in cities in a way that is positive rather than negative. This is former Mayor Bloomberg of New York City standing in a mock-up, just tape on the floor, of a 300-square-foot micro-unit. And Mayor Bloomberg's point was that to remain, for New York City to remain economically competitive, they had to provide affordable housing for everyone not served by market-rate housing. Market-rate housing basically serves rich people. With, with luxury housing, that leaves out everyone else. That leaves out students, young professionals, families, working class people working in the city, elderly people, etc. This 300 square foot apartment was terribly designed, in my opinion. <laughs> Not very livable. We thought we could do better. We thought we could actually build a smaller apartment, 200 square feet, that's 19 square meters that could function as if it was three times larger by the creative application of good design and, and technology. Uh, we like to build things, so we build a prototype. The criteria to the students was it had to have a queen-size bed, okay? It also had to have an eight-foot desk, fully equipped office. It needed to accommodate a dinner party of six people. It needed to have a living room, that could seat six to eight people. Had a very compact bathroom, but it needed to at least provide the ability for handicap access so the bathroom opens up for dressing. Has a very small, compact, but very functional kitchen, but you can double the counter space if you want to fix a meal. This was also a laboratory to look at different interfaces, so we used touch sensors to move, voice, recognition, these are my students, they're not great actors, but they were having fun, they were having fun that day. Everything worked here. We thought it was, we put this video out on the web, we had about a million views on YouTube in three weeks. Um, Ikea joined our group, this was actually a furniture play. The idea is you built very inexpensive open loft chassis, living spaces, with the power and data, mechanical attachment, envelope, all carefully designed. And then you introduce customized infill. So this is a solution for young people. You could have the same solution for elderly people, the uh, same conceptual solution for elderly people, but very different implementation. We've worked with developers to try these, uh, these ideas at scale. This is a study for a micro unit in New York City for a developer. Uh, the smallest apartment that's legal, smallest kitchen in Manhattan, smallest bathroom that's legal. Uh, the, the, the charge here was to again design a unit that was three times more functional than a typical unit of that size. So in this case, you see a very large living room, but there's nowhere to sleep. King size bed comes down from the ceiling. A table comes down from the ceiling to create a workplace for startups or a dinner party for 10 people. Uh, and we did a whole series of these versions. Now, we, it's, easy, it's easy to do renderings or to do these design studies. The question is, can you actually develop the mechatronics that could plausibly 
be part of the supply chain that developers could actually use. So in this case, we have robo walls that move, tables and beds that go up and down. And we are looking at launching in May a startup to commercialize this technology to provide solutions directly to developers. By the way, this is um, a larger version for a family apartment where you have bedroom, living room, dining room, study, now you have two bedrooms, now it all is opened up for a playroom or a party space with the, and, and there's endless variations of this that are possible if you have a toolkit that allows for these kind of transformations. Uh, we're also looking at the same for, uh, for the office. In this case, this is, a quick, this is a quick study. It's not good enough yet to put on YouTube, but so I'm showing it to you here, but we will continue to work on it. In this case, we have robo desks and chairs and couches. The idea is in a co-working facility, typically a space is rented out to three times the number of people who could be accommodated at any given time because at any given time only a third of the people are there. Uh, they're people of diff with different needs, different companies, different spatial configurations are required. Some people need all open space. Some people need meeting spaces. Uh, in this case, uh, she gets a sedentary alert. The desk lifts up. It goes over, and she's docked with a, she's docked with a, uh, with a treadmill. Uh, so you can see a very agile configuration. Some of this is a little corny and maybe not ready for prime time, but the, but I, but the basic point is that uh, architectural robotics that re allow for the dynamic reconfiguration of space is the future. In fact, I would say urban space is too valuable to be static. That makes no sense because life is too complicated. We're doing the same thing with lighting. This is, uh, here we have a sensor network in this environment. We can recognize a whole range of office activities and dynamically tune the intensity and the color of the light in response to the activities. These are the sensors that are firing. Blue light, by the way, uses 30% less energy than full spectrum white light. We've installed this in a living lab experiment. We had people live with this for months at a time. Uh, you see she sits down, the light goes white, he gets up, the light goes blue, we're looking at different colors, she walks in the room. It's all automated. Uh, and she puts paper down on the table, the lamp goes on, we have a vision system, picks up the phone, the light goes red at the, at the entry to signal that it's not a good time to, to interrupt. The energy savings is easy to cal calculate, M much more difficult is to determine the acceptance of these ideas in that kind of an office. And of course, what we found, I say of course, it wasn't a surprise to me. The young people loved it. They missed this dynamic environment when it was taken away. The older people, more skeptical of change, did not like it as much. And so you need tailored solutions according to whoever you're designing for. This is fundamentally how we design cities today. We privilege machines. We design for cars. You know, the, the transportation engineers have power, widths of streets, turn lanes, highway connections. Um, I, it's not uh, the best approach, in my opinion, to designing cities. This is uh, where I was last week in Barcelona, Las Ramblas, which evolved over time as a beautiful high density, high diversity place for people. This is a city designed for people rather than machines. We believe that if you start with people, you design compact, diverse, walkable communities, you introduce systems that strengthen these social ties, make them broader and deeper, you privilege creative interactions of people, you manage the density, you increase the diversity through the introduction of these, these new systems. You deploy good urban design that, that gets the proximity right so people have access to at least 80% of what they need in daily life within five or 10 minute walk. That will increase innovation in the community. And you will get all of these by default. You'll get your smart city, green, sustainable, eco, intelligent, low carbon city because they will follow naturally when you build compact, 
uh, walkable communities because all of the systems that you will then introduce support these goals. But don't start here. Start with people. So my, my message is design for people, not for machines. Then add technology when it's useful. Thank you.